Welcome to Triumphant Spirit, America's World War II Generation Speaks. This program is a series of broadcasts featuring the stories of a generation that fought and won the Second World War. No matter how they fought the war or where, on the home front or the battlefield, each veteran featured on the program contributed valiantly to a victory that changed the 20th century. Here are their stories in their own words. They are stories of actions and deeds that not only helped shape the outcome of the war, but the very world we live in today. On June 6, 1944, the Allies invaded Northwest France across five beaches on the Normandy coast, codenamed Sword, Juno, Gold, Omaha, and Utah. At Utah Beach, the goal was to move swiftly inland, block off the Cotentin Peninsula from German counterattack, and seize the key port of Cherbourg on the tip of the peninsula. Participating in this crucial operation as a young officer was Monmouth County Freeholder Ted Narazanic. Ted, a captain in the U.S. Army, served with the 206th Quartermaster Battalion in the European theater of war. He participated in the Normandy, northern France, Ardennes, Rhineland, and Central Europe campaigns. He was awarded the Bronze Star, the nation's fourth highest award for meritorious service in battle. You were serving the National Guard before being mustered into federal service in September 1940. What was the National Guard like then, and how seriously did they train? Basically, we received information in the summer of 1940 that if the federal government federalized the National Guard, mm -hmm. we would be called to active duty for about a year, and then we would be discharged and held in reserve should something occur. However, in September of 1940, a group of us from a little community that I was born and raised in Englishtown, we were sitting at a confectionery store one night or the ice cream parlor, and somebody said, you know, we're going to have a war very shortly. I think we ought to go down and enlist in our National Guard unit and do our year and come back. That very night, we all got into separate cars and we went down to Freehold, where the Agricultural Agency is today on Court Street. We walked in and we said we want to join, go back on active duty. They swore us in from that point on. We were actually in the Army, the National Guard. And I'll never forget the date on September the 16th, 1940, all the army trucks were lined up on Court Street, right in Freehold. We were told to get aboard, and they took us to Fort Dix, and that's really started our military career, or more particularly, my military career for some five years. As a matter of fact, Paul, we were the first unit to occupy the barracks at Fort Dix since World War I. We were the first unit in there. And of course, now to look back some 56 years later to say, what did we do? What did we accomplish? It's an experience that I certainly would have never wanted to miss, but there were a lot of disappointments. There were a lot of good times. There was a lot of happiness. There was a lot of sadness, but it was an experience that everybody should have. Ted, were you kept informed about what was happening overseas in Europe as well as in Asia? Pretty much so, pretty much so. Yeah, we would have lectures during the day, sometimes in the evening at the barracks. We would have lectures as to what's happening, current events. And the prime topic of discussion, if you will, was always how are we progressing towards our year of active duty and our return to a reserve status. But there was very little information on that. And as I recall it now, we were on maneuvers down in the Carolinas, and on the way back from our maneuvers, we bivouacked overnight on the Gettysburg Battleground. And that's the evening that we heard that the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor, December mm -hmm. 7th, 1941. Mm -hmm. And from that point on, all of our discussions about coming home and being in reserve for a year vanished. You were sent to Officers Candidate School at Camp Lee, Virginia. Can you recall your experiences at Camp Lee? Yes, and uh, we were down in the 
what they called Stonyfield, South Carolina, which was right on the outskirts of the Citadel, the Citadel University uh, Military School. And I applied for officer candidate school and I was accepted. And I think I started in September of 1942. And of course we had at that time, officer candidate schools were for a three month period where you had very, very intensive training and you were put through the line, so to speak, to see what you could take and what you couldn't take. You were shipped to England in February of 1944. Right. When you were loaded on board ship, what was the weather like during that period of time? Well, it was a very bad uh, time. There was a lot of wind, as I recall it. I know the water was quite high because when we got off a landing craft, the front end of the craft went down so that a vehicle could roll off. Well, we, when we landed, we were on Utah Beach, incidentally. And that was a lot different from what they called Omaha, which you had the cliffs and whatnot. But the Utah Beach was not bad. It was right up to the uh, beach itself, practically, but we still were in water. Because I remember sitting in the Jeep, the driver or the passenger's side of the Jeep, and where we had water up to our waist. But nevertheless, the Jeep was, still went through, and most of the vehicles went through till we got up on the beach. Ted, as you said, your unit landed on Utah Beach during the Normandy invasion. Can you take us back to that day and tell us what it was like? Well, it was very early in the morning. Uh, the water was a little bit rough yet. We were wondering how, whether we were going to swim or what and all this. You, there was so much anxiety about it. You know, you didn't know till you actually got into the condition. When we finally got on the beach, uh, and got our vehicles in somewhat of an order as to where our unit actually was because they were on more than one landing craft. The paratroopers that had landed earlier on a couple of days before, we did not land on D-Day. We were at, I think, D plus two or three, something like that. But the paratroopers were coming back to the beach and they were reporting the beach they were going to get back on boats to take them back to England because they had did a tremendous job you know in the uh, landing so early prior to early morning of D-Day and I can never forget them to the sight of them they had these very big large jumpsuits on and with the big pockets uh, on their chest on their legs and most of those pockets all had like a bottle of cognac or a bottle of champagne. Many of them had the German Lugers, the pistols that the Germans used. Uh, you know, they were a hot commodity at that time. Everybody wanted a German Luger. But to see the reaction, their faces, and uh, how they, their actual deportment coming back, uh, you knew they were in for a terrible thing, you know. But they were going back to England for or and or rest and relaxation and whatnot. Ted, after you left Utah Beach, you were in Hedgerow country in France. That's right. Can you tell us what the Hedgerows were like and what effect did they have on moving your vehicles? Well, they were very, very uh, important because not only did they serve as a camouflage for a lot of, but you couldn't really use the Hedgerow uh, as a vehicle path or anything like that. Uh, it was very difficult to get around. We had to stick around and try to get on most of the little old dirt roads that were available uh, around a farm or around a particular house and whatnot. There's always a lot of anxiety as to where we were going, what we were going to be faced with. Uh, you never knew, and uh, everybody was so on edge, to tell you the truth, you know. Uh, it was not like the infantry, of course, where they were many times in combat, hand-to-hand uh, -hand and whatnot. But nevertheless, we, were had, we had a mission to do. We had to report for our railhead supplies, for our food, for ammunition, for gasoline. We knew we had a mission, but there was always that anxiety as to where we were going, what's going to happen, you know. Where did your unit go after the breakout from Normandy? 
Well, after that, we started following the United States First Army. We were a portion of the First Army as special troops. And uh, General Bradley, I believe, was our commander at that time. Uh, he was moving very rapidly. We got into uh, a big portion of France. We got into uh, Belgium, uh, Holland, Luxembourg. You moved that quickly? That quickly. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Did you ever get to Paris? Yes, we did. And of course, I recall an incident when you mentioned about Paris. When we were in the uh, QM unit, I was transferred to the battalion headquarters. And my job was to precede the battalion and try to find spaces where the vehicles could be parked adequately, where there was maybe some security, uh, where some of the troops could be housed and so forth in factories or old buildings. And I was given the responsibility to go ahead and precede our unit, the battalion. I remember getting into Paris. I had a Jeep. The Jeep had its name on the front of the windshield and I called it the Jersey Bounce, being from Jersey. Did you have an opportunity to meet the Parisian and what were their feelings about their liberation? Very excited, very excited. Many of them were thank, thanking us and so forth for being there, for helping them. As you know, the Germans occupied Paris for some time. But then, of course, when the Americans got there, things changed. But mostly, the French were very, very appreciative of the Americans and what we were doing to help them. Your unit participated as a support unit during the Battle of the Bulge in Belgium in December 1944. Can you tell us what happened and what were your experiences? There was a lot of snow on the ground, very, very cold. And I know that at that point, we were transferred from the 1st United States Army to the 3rd Army, which was under the command of General George Patton then. And of course, he was coming with the tanks and all of his armored divisions to Bastogne and really to the Battle of the Bulge. And to keep up with him was a task because he required so much gasoline. And our function was to really supply the gasoline. I don't know if you've ever heard, but there was a uh, situation in France. They called it the Red Ball Express. That was used by the truckers, the army trucks, night and day, constantly going, carrying supplies. But during that Battle of the Bulge, our main responsibility was to carry gasoline and ammo for the 3rd United States Army. And I think our soldiers did a very creditable job. We were cited many, many times for the work that we were doing. Ted, I asked you before about the weather conditions prior to the Normandy invasion. Let me take you back to December 1944. What were the weather conditions at that period of time? This was during the Battle of the Bulge. Yeah, that was very, very bad. Uh, of course, the Jeeps and everything, you know, we had no enclosure other than a canvas top. It was very, very cold. The snow was all over. The vehicles had a tough time in traveling on some of the old dirt roads. Another factor, there was a lot of uh, military equipment, uh, some American equipment that were clogging the roads, as well as some of the German equipment that was clogging the roads, you know what I mean? So it was very difficult to really get around. But nevertheless, we had a mission to do, and our soldiers went at it full blast. I was going to ask you, how did your, how did your soldiers react to these conditions? They reacted great. Uh, you couldn't ask for more. If they had an assignment to do, if 16 trucks had to be at a given spot, you know that the 16 trucks were going to be there. And of course, another thing that we had to always take into consideration, many of the Germans would capture some of the Americans, like the military police, put their uniforms on and stand at a particular road or crossroad and direct you in the wrong direction. And eventually they knocked you off. Now I know that we lost, uh, usually we had 16 trucks like in a platoon that would take off and be under the leadership of a lieutenant, second lieutenant or a first lieutenant. Many times we'd lose one or two trucks 
We never knew what happened to them, where they ever went, but we always suspected that sometimes they took the wrong turn or were directed in a wrong uh, direction by the Germans. Of course, we never could prove that or anything, but we always suspected that. But they did a tremendous job in carrying out their mission. I'm so proud that I was part of that type of a unit. Ted, during the Battle of the Bulls, the infamous Malmody Massacre took place. Were you made aware of that incident? Uh, were you told about uh, what had happened? Yes, although I was not at Malmody and or seen it, but we, the rumor went, or the facts, the information was very prevalent. Everybody knew that what the Germans were do, doing and what they had done, and that was always on all the soldiers' mind. They wanted, don't send me towards Malmody. They're always afraid, you know, that something was going to occur. But the rumors were present. Uh, the information was given to you constantly. Ted, after the Battle of the Bulge, the war quickly came to an end. Where were you when the war ended, and what were your experiences then? Well, let's see. When it ended, uh, I think I was in Luxembourg for a while. We were in Belgium for a while. Then our unit moved to uh, Mannheim, Germany. We were there for a while. And uh, our mission was, again, still to provide some of the replacement depots and the military installations, their food, their gasoline, uh, not so much weaponry anymore because the war was over, but it was primarily on concentrating our mission to keep them supplied and to always think when we were going to leave and head for home. That was the main thing. When are we going to actually leave? But they were the days that you counted, how many more days are we going to have here, you know, because everybody wanted to go home. Of course, when the hostilities ceased and the war was really over, there was a lot of unrest, really, among all the troops because they wanted to get back to the United States. It also afforded you the opportunity to maybe see what was going on around the country. I recall one incident where my commanding officer and I, he was a lieutenant colonel at that time, and I was in the grade of captain. We had an opportunity in April of 1945 to visit the and see the Buchenwald concentration camp. Ted, could you tell us about that in detail? That's an experience that you probably would never forget. You had to actually be there and see it. Uh, the conditions were such, and there were still people there that were assigned to that concentration camp. And to see their physical condition and whatnot made you almost want to cry that how could one human treat another human in this fashion? We entered one building where they had the conveyors. And again, some of this is very, very unpleasant to talk about, but it existed. They had conveyors that went down to a series of ovens where they put these people on the conveyor and took them right into an oven, upset the conveyor uh, bench or bed-like or platform so that the person that was on it went into an oven and burned them. And to see the sights like that made you want to cry. You couldn't take too much of it. So we were there for a short while, but then we had to leave because it just it impacted and affected you so bad. And I could see like some of the buildings, they might have been, oh, just to pick out maybe 75 or 100 feet long, just an ordinary wooden building. And it would have a shelf, maybe six inches or six feet off the floor. And that shelf would be divided into partitions. And maybe eight or 10 people that were assigned in that concentration camp would be in that little compartment. No mattress, no nothing, just in that uniform that they wore, and to see him living in that condition. You know, you couldn't take much of that to see it today. 
But I think out of all of that experience, that's probably the worst that I have ever seen or come in contact with. Because then you, you, you just couldn't imagine that somebody could be doing this. Ted, you received a Bronze Star Medal. Could you tell us why you were awarded this decoration? Well, I don't know. There were so many different incidents that were involved uh, with the award when it came through for, I think it said something, for meritorious action in face of enemy operations or something. That There were so many different things. So to try to pick out something that I can honestly say I did this or did that for the bronze medal. I, I don't know which one it could have been, you know. After the war, you returned to the States in September. What was it like coming home? And did you talk to others about your experiences? Well, you had the opportunity to talk to many of the veterans that were around the area, the English town that we served. Maybe they served in the Navy, the Army, the Air Force. But you had an opportunity to talk. As a matter of fact, I was the first commander of a starting American Legion post, 434 in Englishtown. We built our own building. Uh, today it's still in existence. So there was a lot of uh, camaraderie, so to speak. You were veterans, you stood for something, and you had to do something. Then, of course, I got interested in the town itself. Ran as a member of the borough council, was successful for several years. Then they said, with your background, you better run to be the mayor. I was the fifth mayor of the town since 1888. I was successful, served altogether as a councilman and a mayor for 19 years, served nine years as a member of the Board of Education and kept my business going until the time when the farms started to disappear and the developments, housing developments, came in. And then when the strip malls started to come in on Highway 9 and whatnot, two guys from Harrison, Voronado, these big chains where the independent guy didn't have the capital and didn't have the stock and the supplies to keep up with them. Our business was gradually going lower and lower, and my wife was running it. And I took a job with the state of New Jersey in the Department of Treasury at that time, and it was called the Division of Local Government Services. My salary was $3,200 a year. Can you imagine that? $3,200 a year. And I started that job in 1954. And then I had an opportunity to be the budget director in the county of Monmouth and I started there on January the 1st of 1957. My salary then was 6000 I was living like a king. And of course, now I'm in my 43rd year of government service with the county of Monmouth. 27 years as the administrator, finance director, now 16 years as a freeholder, and I love it. If I can help the people, Regardless who they are, I want to do that. And that's my ambition, to help the people. Ted, you're a distinguished veteran and a distinguished public official. Do you have anything to say to today's generation? Well, again, Paul, what you're doing here with the Center for the Studies of World War II, to try to give the information to our generations that are coming of what was happening at World War II, why did we have the war? The war in the Pacific, the war in Europe, the people that masterminded those, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, Hitler, what he was doing, to tell the young people today what our country is, how great it is, the pride and the spirit of the American people and what they can do. There's so much that can be told to our young people today that are in schools, whether it's a grammar school, a middle school, or a high school, or a college. They have to know what we went through during that period. Here it is 56 years later. We're still talking about 
World War II, its impact on our country. So it's the greatest thing we can do. And I try to get to the veterans. I want to support them as much as I can. We have our veterans that are going out to grammar schools today, talking to them about the war, not the technicalities of it, but the general attitude, what was going on, why we were there, and why we had to be successful. So it's a great opportunity for us. But again, it's for our veterans that have done so much for so many people. They're the people I want to support.